And today is all about planning for your spring garden. Um, we have with us master gardeners from uh, Fairfax County Master Gardeners Association. We have uh, John Kratzer, who will be talking about crop rotation in the spring garden. And we have uh, Leslie Moore that will be talking about amending your soil. I'm Liz Train, I'm with the Green Spring Master Gardeners um, unit. And we also have Nancy Miller from Fairfax County Master Gardeners Association who is uh, providing Zoom support as well. So that is our lineup. Um, th this again is John Kratzer from Fairfax County Master Gardeners Association. And I'm looking forward to presenting today on uh, crop rotation, something that's often skipped over, not thought about. Uh, we think of it as something that's done on giant industrial farms, uh, but it's actually something very, very important to do in your home garden. So next slide. So what, what is crop rotation? So it's basically the practice of planting different crops um, in the same area uh, in sequential years so that you can improve the soil health, optimize nutrition uh, in the soil, and also combat, combat uh, pest issues and weed pressures. Um, there's, uh, yeah, sorry, and why, why it matters is that uh, there's different vegetable families. Um, there's, there's some experts say there's 11 specific ones, but um, regardless of the number that's agreed to, there's a lot of different vegetable families and they, each of them takes different things out of the soil and they bring different things uh, to the soil. And if you keep using the same thing over and over again, every year, you're taking the same nutrients out of the soil to the point where you then completely deplete them. Uh, just after one season, you'll start to see a significant reduction in vegetable output. Um, in my experience, this is particularly true with tomatoes, uh, but uh, you'll start to see it go down and go down. Um, and then in order to combat that, people will then suddenly decide, oh, I need to fertilize more. Um, that must be what the problem is. And they fertilize more and the plants do come back some, uh, but rather than using natural um, fertilizers, you now have to put chemicals in there and crop rotation is a great way to avoid that. So uh, also uh, within plant families, uh, plants are often susceptible to the same pests. Um, I have a picture here of the uh, tomato hornworm many people are familiar with. Um, if you don't rotate the, uh, your crops, these pests can start to make a permanent home in the garden bed because their preferred food is there. Um, and a lot of times these pests, particularly in their early stages, can't travel very far. Um, they don't have to have wings to get up and go search your yard for stuff. So they, they're going to come up from the soil and they're going to be looking for something right there. And if there's not anything right there, a lot of them will, will likely die. Uh, as, as we know from butterflies um, and caterpillars, you know, they, these things all feed on very specific things. Um, so, if you're good, so if you have like a so soil-borne diseases, like early blight, which also attacks tomatoes, tomato hornworms, uh, you know, they can wreak havoc. Um, but there are, you know, those, those things winter over um, in the soil. So if you rotate the crops, and, and suddenly, if you've got, you know, the next year you have, you know, lettuce in that spot, uh, the tomato homeworm is not going to have anything to eat um, and, and it will lessen the impact they have on your garden. Um, and again, it, it'll, it'll in, uh, it, as people, if they don't rotate the crops and, you know, every year tomato hornworms become a big deal, now you're using a pesticide uh, or something on those. Uh, and by doing crop rotation, again, another good way. Uh, to avoid adding chemicals to your soil. So uh, as I mentioned, there's, you know, I, I did a lot of research on this and there's a lot of different, you know, experts have different uh, assessments of what makes a vegetable group and, and how many there are. Based on my research, I'm going to go with the people who said there's 11, uh, but let's just call it about a dozen. But you can, most of us have a, you know, have a small yard. We don't have a ton of different uh, garden beds. Um, and a lot of the, a lot of the uh, research has broken everything down to four simple groups that have very similar nutrient and pest characteristics. Um, and just for fun, they call them roots, shoots, fruits, and then, then the legumes are, or, and, and cover crops. Um, so let's go, if we go to the next slide, we can talk a little bit about the different ones. So your roots are your, basically your root vegetables. Um, 
your onions, your beets, your carrots, that kind of stuff there. Um, they are light feeders on the soil. They are not taking a ton of nutrients out of the soil. They do do a great job of breaking up the soil by sending those roots down. Um, they do take up a lot of calcium and potassium. Um, next, if we go to the shoots, now we're talking about things where we're eating the greens. Um, and you'll notice, by the way, some of these, as far as root shoots and fruits, some of these uh, are, if you were to use them in different contexts, you wouldn't call them that thing. For example, radish. The radish is a, a heavier feeder than most. So we have radish and shoots uh, because people do eat radish leaves, but that's just, that's just the family that it's in. Uh, cabbage, kale, that kind of stuff there. Um, moderate feeders, most of them, there's a little bit of variation there. Uh, but in general, they can follow the really heavy feeders without much issue. They, they don't, they're not going to deplete the soil so much um, and they can survive on less nutrition. Um, so they're good ones to follow um, the heavy feeders, um, which gets us to fruits. So these are the things like your tomatoes, your cucumbers, your melons, even potatoes, which I know are generally considered a root, but because um, they grow below ground. But the, the potatoes are on there. Peppers, of course, are you know, peppers, tomatoes, uh, um, eggplant, all part of that same um, um, nightshade family. They're very, very heavy feeders. Um, they're big users of nitrogen in the soil. Um, they're also highly susceptible to different soil-borne infections, soil-borne pests. Uh, again, I keep bringing up the tomato hornworm, but it's not only that. So these are the ones where if you plant them year after year after year in the same spot, it really depletes the soil. And then there's your legumes or cover crops. These are peas and beans, but there's also some grains that are in that group. Um, their feeding needs vary, but they are nitrogen fixers, meaning that they're able to take nitrogen out of the air and, and convert that into a usable form for plants. So you, you go through and you, you, know, you have your, your season of peas or whatnot, or you plant the cover crop, then at the end, when, when, it's all, when it's the right time, you cut it down, let it die, then you till it into the soil or just turn it into the soil. Um, and that decomposing plant matter um, adds a lot of nitrogen back into the soil. So next. So how it works in the home garden. So with the four groups, you can set up a rotation that kind of lasts, I would say like three to five years. Um, one of the things that's important to keep in mind though, and, and all of the literature highlights this as well, it's that you know, don't, don't lose sleep over having this thing be perfect. You have a limited sized yard um, and you also wanna grow flowers and other things like that. So it's not like we all have the opportunity to have you know, eight different garden beds that, we, that are all of equal size that we can easily move around. Likewise, the other thing that uh, um, people have highlighted about ways that this failed was that they try to turn all their gardens into the same size for rotation, but when they move their tomatoes to the next one, they put something in where tomatoes were, you know, they, they suddenly decide they've got way too many peas or way too much spinach or something like that because um, they're trying to match these things exactly. Just take a deep breath, do your best to move them around um, and, 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 and you'll be fine. Again, don't, don't try to focus on perfection here, but the way, a, a system that is commonly followed is um, so for the first growing season in, in any specific bed, you can start with the roots. Uh, so they'll break up the soil. They don't take too much nutrient out of it. Um, the next season, um, your legumes, uh, you know, you got peas and beans in there. Or if it's like, a, a, you know, in the off season, you could put a cover crop in there. They'll, they do fine in the soil that was recently loosened by the roots. Um, and then they were, they're nitrogen fixing, as I mentioned. So they'll add a ton of new nitrogen to the dirt. You can immediately then follow that in the next growing season with the fruits. So they're heavy nitrogen feeders. There's all this new nitrogen in there from the, from the cover crops and the legumes before. Um, and they will then do great. And then the next year, you can, or the, the next growing season, you can put in your shoots, lighter, lighter feeders. They can handle coming after fruits, um, no trouble at all. Um, the one thing I want to point out here, I've talked about, I don't just say year one, year two, I say growing season one, growing season two, because, and that's why the span of time is three to five years, because 
some things you only get like one seed, like for example, tomatoes. We're only growing tomatoes here in the summer. Um, but for some things, particularly in the Virginia, Northern Virginia environment, some of these things you can grow well into the winter or they grow over the winter, like, like a lot of the cover crops. So you can go through this entire rotation um, if you plan properly in, in three years or even less, um, depending, on what, depending on what you're growing. Um, Oops, sorry, can you go back one? No, sorry, go, you, you went back the first time. Go one more. Yep, one more. So remember that uh, um, this succession planning where you do one crop right after another isn't just another form of crop rotation. Uh, and there's a lot of literature available. You can, you can research online. The Virginia Crop Extension has it on succession planning um, where you're planting um, another crop either right after the first one or you're planting them in between the first one that's at the end of its cycle. And by the time you're cutting that off and, and, and throwing that away, the second one's coming along. That's just another form of, of, of crop rotation. So uh, again, similar to my earlier comments, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. A perfect crop rotation system would involve moving crops based on their exact nutritional needs, the exact pathogens and pests and things, and their root structure, et cetera. It can get extremely complicated. If you are running an industrial farm, uh, well, first, you shouldn't be getting your gardening information here <laughs> if you have a giant industrial farm. But the, that is when they're, they're doing all this stuff. Your home garden, you do not have to do that. Um, likewise, uh, as I, I think I mentioned a little bit early, uh, most vegetable gardeners have their several favorites and things that they'd like to grow. You do not want to have a ton of tomatoes one year uh, and then the exact same space filled with Swiss chard the next year uh, if you don't eat Swiss chard. Um, so do, do it in a man, you know, you kind of have to balance it between the, the, the needs of the soil and what you and your family uh, will consume or give away or enjoy growing. So uh, a little additional note about cover crops. So cover crops, um, and I, I did a presentation on this um, a few weeks ago. So if you, and I use them uh, in all of my uh, vegetable garden beds. In fact, I just planted a bunch uh, over this weekend. The Virginia Cooperative Extension YouTube page will have uh, the video of me presenting on cover crops earlier. But just as a short uh, overview, uh, cover crops, also called green manure, are a great way to re rejuvenate the soil, replenish nutrient loss. Um, they also crowd out weeds. Um, some of them do a great job of crowding out weeds. Um, the cover crops, they consist of certain legumes and grains that are nitrogen fixing. Um, and a lot of them, you can do cover crops, depending on the, on, the, on the particular needs of the soil, there's different times of the year you can do them, but a lot of them are done in the fall. And their plant, they will start growing, in the fall until the first frost, they will be dormant through the winter. And as soon as the first warm weather in the spring comes, they kick right back in. The photo here is of hairy vetch. Um, and that's one of the ones that I use a lot. It grows like crazy um, in my soil right after tomatoes. It grows like crazy and then I cut it down, wait a few weeks for it to die, till it into the soil. And uh, I, you know, not long after I'm putting my seedlings, the tomato seedlings in, uh, and they just take off in the speed of light because all that new nitrogen is in the ground. So again, you can see the presentation on that at the Virginia Cooperative Extension YouTube page. Also wanted to address uh, letting a bed go fallow. Um, this, is, this is a way that um, a lot of people used to, used to do um, uh, help replenish the soil. Um, uh, one of the things that they would do, and I found this kind of funny when I was doing the research, so that's why I use this picture, or whatever. They'll they'll let a bed go fallow, but it'll become the place where they let their chickens uh, feed. So basically, the chickens are just running around eating insects and pooping all over everything, uh, and that way the the ground is being uh, uh, rejuvenated with nutrients from the chickens, uh, and the pests are being eaten by the chickens. Uh, th this is still not a bad thing, but in general, it's considered less attractive than doing cover crops. Um, as the bed can become prone with weeds, um, you know, if the, if the chickens aren't, you know, constantly trampling them. Uh, and, well, first of all, many of us don't have chickens, but if you just leave a bed all by itself, um, it can fill up pretty quickly with weeds. 
um, and is more prone to having issues with erosion. Um, uh, whereas a, a, a bed that you're not using for a particular vegetable uh, filled with cover crops will crowd out weeds, the soil structure stays intact, and you get the benefit of the nitrogen um, at the end of the season. So some final thoughts, just a couple things. Um, uh, be sure to keep a garden journal to document what you've grown. I have looked at my garden and I have said to myself, oh, I mean, this was a great gardening year. How could I possibly forget where I put different vegetables? Well, I have found out um, uh, as I get older, I, and like many people uh, who are probably watching these, we forget things. And so I now write it down. I got a little thing in, you know, a little thing on my phone where I note where I planted everything so that in the winter time, when I'm going through deciding on next year, I can look and kind of pick out what I want. I kind of do that together with my seed purchases so that I have an idea of where I'm going to put everything. But you will forget where everything was, particularly after a couple of seasons of moving around. So be sure to document it. And then the last thing I wanted to mention um, is that although some of these heavy feeders, you know, like tomatoes, they take a lot of nitrogen out of soil, et cetera, it's always a good idea to have a soil test done in your garden beds. Um, they're easy to do. You can see more information on, on doing them at the Virginia Cooperative Extension website um, because there might be something else depleting from your soil that you need to address. And there's very likely a, a, a very, um, you know, environmentally safe, natural way of doing it. Uh, but that's the real way to tell what your soil needs. Um, so with that, I have a slide of references that I used. You can go to. Um, always recommend the Virginia Tech site there at the top. Um, but if there is any other questions, uh, let me know. Oh, let's see. Somebody's got something in chat. Um, so we do have a question for John um, from Ray. Do you advocate using dead leaves to compost during winter as cover for garden during the winter? Uh, yes, uh, absolutely. Um, I, and obviously we're talking about, you know, dead leaves of something like uh, an oak or a maple or something like that. We're not talking about dead uh, weeds. Uh, but, but yeah, that actually is a perfect way. And um, it was a little bit off the topic of the conversation, but one thing I certainly recommend to people is to not just take all the leaves and things that have fallen in your garden and throw them away. Because even though we talked about the soil being the home of some of the pests we don't like, those leaves are often home of some of the bugs that we do like. And, and we don't want to just throw those away. But leaves are uh, uh, a great way to um, have, you know, that decaying leaves are a great thing um, that can, they can suppress weeds um, as they break down over the course of the, uh, of the winter, they can then be tilled or, or, or raked into that area and offer uh, nutrition to the soil. Um, so that's a good, a good thing. And then the side thing, as I mentioned, is um, just, you know, you don't want to be filling your uh, yard waste bags um, with uh, the larva and eggs of a lot of beneficial insects. So uh, hold off on just throwing all of that away. Uh, let it decompose naturally in your garden and, and you'll, you'll be happy you did. Thank you, John. Any other questions before we move on to soil? Okay, all right. Leslie, over to you. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, when I started this, uh, research, I didn't think this was going to be a very long topic, but it, I kept going and going on finding research. So um, I, I think I'm just barely scratching at the surface too. So anyway, um, so you need to know your components of soil. Um, and it's really made up of minerals, which are small fragments of rocks that are broken down, air, water, um, organic matter, which are plant and animal remains um, that are decaying, um, and then microorganisms. And evidently a tablespoon of soil contains billions of microorganisms. So um, they're important to all the crops and everything that is going on um, in, in the gardens. So, and soil amendments are any material added to the soil to improve its physical or chemical properties. So that's kind of a general term. So you need to know your soil. 
um, get a soil test. We always stress this, but if you haven't had a soil test, um, get it, get one done every three to four years. Um, you take several samples. If you're out in your yard, it, you want your lawn tested, um, take like 10 samples, mix it together and let it dry and send it um, in the soil test kits that we have. Um, you can get them at the libraries and they have them at the um, in-person plant, in plant garden uh, plant clinics too. Um, you, you also need to know whether you have, uh, what, what kind of soil you have. Is it clay? Is it loam? Or is it sandy? It's usually a combination of that. You want to take a, if you don't know, take a, a handful of the soil and try to form it into a ball. And if it forms like a tight ball that's kind of malleable, it's probably clay. And if you live in this area, you have a lot of clay. Um, if it's gritty, um, then it has sand in it. Um, and loam is, has a lot of organic material. So the, uh, loam is really what we're striving for um, in uh, our gardens. Um, and you also need to know whether it's compacted. If it's compacted, it doesn't have much air um, and the water can't get into uh, to feed the roots. Um, and it's also important to know whether you have a hard surface crust. So, because then again, things run off, um, you can't get the, the minerals and the, what the, the plant needs to survive if it has a hard surface crust. So, okay. Um, so again, one billion microorganisms and a teaspoon of compost. Um, and it, you want to be adding organic matter into your soil. Um, and this improves the soil high in clay or sand. Um, it helps it retain more moisture, resists compaction, contains a reservoir of nutrients, and improves the soil aeration, water drainage, root growth, and biological activity. So, and it, you have to remember it's a continuous process. You can't just apply it one year and go, oh, the garden is great. It, it continuously decomposes and you have to add it every year. Okay. So I'm gonna go over types of organic matter and there's actually quite a bit. Um, so you can use, you can make your own compost. So um, this includes yard waste, grass clippings, leaves, straw, kitchen scraps. Um, you wanna just use your, your plant scraps, not um, like meat or cheese or dairy, um, but uh, there's a, a whole lectures on composting, so I'm not gonna go into that. Um, you can also buy commercial compost, um, and this is made from agriculture or food waste, animal manure, grass clippings, and leaves. These are generally tested for um, content and quality and contaminants. Um, your risk of the pesticide residue is low since herbicides are short-lived. So these are typically pretty safe to use. Um, you can also make compost tea, which is if you have compost, you can steep it in water. Um, and it's five parts water to one part of compost. You typically let it steep for three, five days. Um, you can also use, if you're into worm, uh, keeping worms, you can use the compost from the worm farms. Um, and it doesn't have a, it's not real high in um, nutrients. So it's very good for fertilizing your seedlings and your transplants because it won't burn out the roots because they're very tender. Okay. Um, other organic matter includes Biosolids, which is a uh, composted sewer sludge. Um, and I guess bloom is a product of the DC biosolids um, that you might see around here. Um, just be careful, it has potential for um, heavy metals and maybe high in salts. So um, use it with caution. Um, another thing that you might find is called biochar and that's charred organic matter, um, you, they burn 
wood waste and agriculture residues without oxygen. Um, I guess it's a, it's a really fine grained charcoal that's porous and stable. They use it in, in um, if they're uh, transplanting trees um, to kind of fill in the, the area. Um, it's low in nutrients, but it holds nutrients. So I guess it's good for mixing in and loosening up soil. Um, and peat moss, is, you see a lot of that being advertised. Um, I guess we don't recommend it uh, because it's not renewable. Um, it's made from pre prehistoric bogs. It has little nutrient value, but it holds your water well. So uh, there's other things that you can use, um, including compost, um, you know, composted leaves, which we have a lot of. So I, I would probably stay away from the, the peat moss if you can. Um, other organic matter includes pine bark fines, which are um, really finely shredded pine bark products. Um, and they, uh, it's, they use this for um, soilless growing media, I think like, like hydroponic kind of stuff. Um, but it can be acidic, so just know your pH and what your plants need. Um, sand can be added. Um, it, it improves your soil if you're growing succulents, um, which I guess they need 50% by volume. Um, sawdust, you can use it, but you really need to uh, compost the sawdust. It can be considered hot. It will burn the plant roots if you add it directly to the soil. Um, but it, that is something that you could add like right now to the soil, let it uh, mix it in really well and it will decay. Um, topsoil, if you go to a uh, nursery and you see bags of topsoil, you don't know where it came from or what it has in it. So make sure that you go to a reputable nursery to get your topsoil. Um, and you can ask them, you know, what's in it. Um, wood ashes uh, from pelleted or wood stoves. Um, these contain a lot of potash and calcium carbonate. Um, they can burn your roots. So it's really not recommended that you um, mix this into your uh, gardens as is. Um, some people will use it in just small amounts. So just be really careful with that. It, it's not really recommended um, and it recommended that you don't compost it too. So um, worm casting is another thing you might be able to find and that, that is very rich in nutrients and microbes. So that's a good one to use. Okay. Um, manure. Um, so if you can find manure, uh, if you have a source, I actually it got some, it was free on uh, next door and we went and picked it up um, in bags. I just left it over winter. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't raw, um, but it does have really good uh, nutrient content um, when plant-based or, or manure-based compost. Um, so you do have to, you do have to be careful with it. You, it, you have to know that it, it uh, has bacteria, it could be um, food safety concerns. Um, if you, it's composted, it has to reach a temperature of 131 degrees for three consecutive days to kill any of the bacteria that may be harmful. And I think it has to go up to 145 degrees for five days to kill the weed seeds. Um, but it, probably has a lot of weed seeds because I don't think they die in the in the horse or cow. So um, just be, know that what you're putting on there um, might give you a lot of uh, headaches if it's not um, uh, composted properly. Um, and the you should not put the uncomposted manure on directly into uh, the gardens, um, especially if you're growing food, um, because there's food safety concerns. It has to be 90 days prior to harvesting crops. They don't recommend it if you're um, using it on leafy greens that you're picking that are right close to the, um, the ground. So 
Um, I would just say recommend compost it before you use it. Um, mulch, uh, mulch, shredded leaves rot faster than whole leaves. Um, be careful with whole leaves on, um, if you're, you're packing them on top uh, around um, like trees, it can actually act kind of like plastic. It will hold the moisture out um, and uh, things can't get down into the ground. So I would say like mix it into your soil or shred it so there's air that can get through um, if you have like a really big area that you're trying to mulch with um, whole leaves. Um, but they are, you, it's free, they're, you, they're really good to protect your beds in the winter. Um, you can also use grass clippings with no herbicides added. Um, and again, you have to mix them into the soil to work as compost um, so that the, the, the plant uh, breaks down and um, supplies the soil. Um, another good mulch is mushroom compost for mushroom farms. You might see that at the stores. And um, you, you may also see mycorrhizae, which are beneficial fungi that occur in soil. Um, they actually are present um, in the tree, you know, in the roots um, of plants, but it doesn't make any sense to, it doesn't help to add them. Um, they're, they're there already, so don't spend your money on purchasing it. Um, other additives that, that you might find uh, or might hear about are Epsom salts. Um, this is a highly soluble form of magnesium and sulfur. This does not present, prevent a reverse blossom end rot, and it actually ties up calcium. So it's not recommended for like your, your uh, tomato end rot, um, and because that's actually a calcium deficiency. So use this only if your soil test recommends it. Um, and the gypsum doesn't affect the soil pH but it's high in calcium, so this actually does prevent your blossom in drought, but it maybe advertises as a clay buster and it's not. So um, it, it's useful for certain things. Uh, it's, it prevents salt injury um, since it removes the sodium from the soil. So if you're on a street where they, they um, de-ice a lot and your your plants are looking pretty sad because of the salt injury then you can add gypsum to the soil to help with that. Um, other inorganic additives are perlite um, which is actually volcanic rock that um, has been crushed and heat treated which I didn't know. Um, vermiculite, tire chunks, um, pea gravel, and sand. Um, so, and they say, do not add sand to clay because it will make your soil structure like concrete. So if you're trying to loosen up your soil, don't add sand um, to the, the clay. Okay, and then the, you can add fertilizers. There's synthetic, which are chemically manufactured. They contain um, one to three ingredients, which is your nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. You can also get natural fertilizers, which contain the same nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium plus organic matter. Um, your quick release um, are your, your quick release fertilizers are your water soluble chemicals that are readily, readily available to plants. You have to be careful with these. You, you can burn your plants out um, if you over apply them, so you need to know what you're doing. Um, in your slow release, water insoluble fertilizers are released over a period of time. You can actually add them at a higher rate and less frequently, but they are more expensive. So read the labels carefully. And then we just we discussed cover crops before, but um, these are great for improving your soil. Um, don't let them go to seed, um, or you'll end up with 
a lot of these popping up all during the season. You want to cut them, and it's best to use a rototiller um, to till them into the ground a couple of weeks before planting. And these are the references that uh, University of Maryland was had a lot of information, so um, that was a good one to use. Okay. Thank you so much, Leslie. Um, oh, I did have the, this oh, the soil amendments. I was going to mention it. Um, there was a paper written by Washington State University. They're saying when you plant, um, like when you are planting things, you read that you're supposed to dig a really big hole and amend the soil and then put the plant back in it. And this was saying you should not do that because it will actually do one of several things. It acts like a plastic container um, because the, the water will drain um, quickly through that amended soil, especially if you have the clay like we do here. And then it doesn't escape because there's too much clay around it. So it will either be too wet if it's really rainy or it will dry out too quickly if it's, if you live in, in like if it's, we get several days without rain. And also the roots will um, grow out, hit that firmer soil and then circle around. So it was saying, do not amend your soil when you're planting like a bush or a tree. So I thought that was interesting. Thank you, Leslie. Um, and John made a comment also, um, if you're purchasing compost in bulk that you wanna be sure the seller is uh, reputable and able to produce a testing certificate um, that's, you know, not all of them do. And that uh, mentioned that locally Merrifield and Veterans Compost do, uh, you know, um, present those testing certificates if asked. So. That's a good tip, thanks.